environmental politics is a different kind of political study and a different kind of political science because it's not just about the ethical and political relationships between people, but it's also between people and the, what you might call the more than human, the many other species with it, within which, and not just species, but biophysical systems that um, have collectively br- allowed life to exist on this, you know, little blue marble floating through space. Um, and that uh, to which we owe um, uh, a responsibility if we want to see life continue into the future. And, you know, that raises interesting questions in terms of how we think ethically, uh, but also ontologically and epistemologically. Welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast a series tackling some of the big questions in the field of environmental politics for university students in Canada. I'm Ryan Katsrazine from the University of Ottawa, co-host of the show along with Dr. Peter Andre from Carleton University. And this is a short introduction to our podcast series, uh, which is available at ecopoliticspodcast.ca. How's it going, Peter? I'm doing well, Ryan, and looking forward to this series. Fantastic. Peter, I wanted to start off um, by talking about a land acknowledgement and what that might look like for a podcast series. So I read a tweet by Wabgashig Rice, who is a former CBC broadcaster in the Ottawa area. Uh, and he's an Anishinaabe Canadian from uh, Wasakasing First Nation. And he wrote this and he said, Zoom meetings are awkward enough. Let's not make them even more awkward by trying to do land acknowledgements for them. <laughs> And I know this is uh, this is not a Zoom meeting, this is a podcast, but it got me thinking a little bit about how do you acknowledge uh, these types of things um, in, in a digital space? So, uh, you know, I thought it'd be important to, to let listeners know that we are both uh, dialing in, so to speak, from the Gatineau region, which is unceded uh, territory of the Algonquin peoples. And we both happen to live uh, very close to the Gatineau River, um, which uh, played a very important role and has played a very important role in in, uh, in the culture of the Algonquin people. Um, and you know, this is something I actually think about a lot as someone who who owns uh, land uh, near the river. Um, and I think about this a lot in an ecological uh, context as well as social terms. But yeah. Maybe I'll turn it over to you. What do you think about how, how, to, how to do a land acknowledgement on a podcast? Well, I think it's a great question. And I think uh, Wab Gizik, uh, suggestion is is right on. And uh, I think one of the implications is that we won't necessarily do a land acknowledgement in every podcast episode. Nonetheless, I think it's important that we're talking about it now. Uh, the to-do land acknowledgements was one of the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And uh, it's been widely picked up. Um, there's some critique of it because sometimes it's done uh, rather... Um, in a cursory fashion and not with much thinking about what it means. And, and my understanding of the point of a land acknowledgement is that as we begin a meeting, a process, a discussion, a negotiation, mm-hmm. we recognize that we are uh, certainly people in Canada today. Canada has only been around for a little over 150 years. And right. yet the territories that we've been on have had uh, Indigenous people on them for much, much longer than that. And uh, many of those Indigenous people have and continue today to see themselves as the stewards of those lands. Um, And uh, the colonial relationship has been uh, disastrous in many cases for Indigenous people in terms of uh, taking away their lands, uh, their language, their culture, uh, diminishing it in the larger Canadian fabric. Um, And I think we're at a time in history where I'm glad that we're really thinking carefully about that. And, And the land acknowledgments are are meant to be a way to bring that into the awareness of this history and the ongoing legacy of colonialism into all of our conversations and actions. And uh, Mm -hmm. one of the ways that I see it quite relevant to this podcast that we're uh, launching into, this podcast series, is that uh, Indigenous people have and still today have a lot to tell us, uh, and I'm like you, a white settler on these lands, my my first generation immigrant here. And um, 
they they have a lot to tell us about what sustainability means uh, both in the past and today. And we will uh, in some of the future episodes, and we'll we'll get to that in a second. I expect that we'll be talking with uh, Indigenous people and 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 entering into some of those discussions about. Um, their worldviews and their un- understandings of uh, the environment and environmental politics and, and what we as students of environmental politics need to be thinking about from that as we uh, try and address what is uh, clearly a, a huge crisis that we're all in these days mm. around the environment. But like you, you know, I'm glad we talked about it. And it, it did also, you know, it does also offer a window into, you know, raising our own positionality as hosts, co-hosts for this uh, mm. podcast series. Um, so maybe that's a, a way of, of, of getting you to, to tell us a little bit about, more about yourself um, and how you ended up uh, as a professor of environmental studies and, and how you ended up doing this podcast. Sure, sure. Um, uh, first thing I should say is I'm, I'm, I'm in the Department of Political Science at Carleton, right. <laughs> though I also do teach courses in environmental studies and geography and political economy at Carleton, but my, my home department is political science. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, I'm, my family are first generation immigrants to Canada. I came here from the Netherlands when I was very young. And, uh, one of the things that, uh, that my family brought here, uh, maybe coming from, uh, I sometimes call the Netherlands, uh, the country, the size of a postage stamp. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty small place for, uh, probably about 20 million people these days, um, and it is, uh, it's a highly managed environment. And one of the things that my dad in particular loved about Canada was the, the openness of the spaces mm. and, and the fact that there's still so many wild places and, and, and uh, beautiful rivers that you can go camping on and so on, like, like the Gatineau River, where mm-hmm. I spend a lot of my time camping. And mm. uh, that kind of um, awareness of the preciousness of, of uh, wild nature um, and, and the need to be very careful about how we, uh, uh, we think about it and care for that going into the future, because many places in the world like the Netherlands have, have lost so much of that kind those kind of spaces, uh, very much shaped my upbringing as a young child and, mm. uh, and, uh, really influenced my eventual interest, uh, in, in studying, environmental issues, mostly from sort of a biology side, environmental sciences side, and then eventually more of sort of a philosophy angle. And uh, it's funny, when I when I was doing my studies, even in university, I, I stayed away from courses that had the word policy in hmm. it because I, I just found that rather boring, I have to say. <laughs> and yet, here we are with uh, an eco-politics podcast that's going to talk a lot about policy. And, and I think that's, I really learned how Actually, my philosophical and biological interests are, uh, you know, that we need to then think about policy in order to protect these, uh, hmm. uh, protect the environment. Uh, so that's a bit about me, Ryan. Uh, how about you? How do you become, uh, how did you come to this place of becoming a professor of uh, ecopolitics? Sure. So, so I should uh, maybe mention a couple core themes that I think would be useful for listeners to know is uh, about my own uh, background. The first is that I, you know, I too am, am a, an immigrant to Canada. I moved here when I was uh, about eight years old. However, my parents were were from uh, North America. My mom was Canadian. My dad was, was uh, American. And we were living, I was born in Costa Rica. And I mention that because Costa Rica has, is sort of renowned, has a sort of identity, national identity as uh, being a very um, environmentally friendly uh, state. And so there's all kinds of, you know, the, the entire uh, economy is oriented around ecotourism and there's all kinds of really innovative um, policies happening, really, uh, you know, uh, ambitious policies for climate mitigation and also like a, a huge chunk of the territory, like a, a quarter of land or, or more is um is essentially reserved for for nature it's uh it's a wildlife reserve so so that kind of national identity instilled in me an interest in in uh in nature and also environmental uh protection from a young age i should also say um i as mentioned earlier i live here on a farm in the uh Udaway region and so my wife is a farmer. Uh, I'm the academic, but I help out when I can. 
and we're trying to farm in a sustainable way. Uh, but, you know, on a daily basis, I am thinking about, um, you know, how our management decisions on this piece of land influence the environment. Uh, we do have animals and there's all kinds of interesting questions about the, the role of livestock in the environment, which, which is kind of filtered into my research and, and hopefully we'll be talking about during the show. Uh, but that's something that's that's a big part of my life, or it has been for for a good chunk of my life, and um, and so that's that's uh, informed my my understanding of environment and environmental policy. And then finally, uh, after my undergrad, I went and spent some time living in Alberta, and this was at a time when Alberta was facing a little bit of a mini oil boom. And I started to get involved with uh, a professor at the University of Ottawa, uh, University of Alberta, Gordon Laxer who was uh, working on questions around energy security in Canada. And, and we started thinking a little bit more about um, the environmental aspects of uh, impacts of oil sands production. And that really kickstarted um, an academic interest in environment, which led to a master's degree, which I did with you. If you don't recall, Peter, you were my supervisor for my master's uh, at Carleton University. And, I remember. And, <laughs> and ever since I've been, I've been wholeheartedly, you know, um, I've had my foot in sort of in the environmental studies camp and the political uh, science camp uh, or political studies, as we call it at the University of Ottawa. So that's that's a little bit about me, and and uh, I think that's useful for for our listeners to hear about um, both of our backgrounds. Um, maybe that's a good opportunity to to switch to um, thinking a little bit about our motivations and for this show and what we're hoping to get out of it. So, if I were to ask you, you know, like what are some of the key uh, themes in environmental politics or eco politics that come to mind? Key themes that you would want to cover in a, in a podcast series like this, what would those be? Yeah, great question. Um, I, you know, I think the first place to start is to say that uh, we are in uh, an environmental crisis. Uh, certainly the climate change issue is uh, first and foremost on a lot of people's minds as, uh, as a crisis that needs resolution as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us we need to take serious action on this issue uh, very quickly. Um, and the kind of action that we're talking about, you know, it's so interesting to think that we're, we're making this series in the time of uh, COVID-19 as uh, we've all just sort of come out of lockdown and this is the summer when things are starting to open up, but we really don't know where it's all going to go in the coming months. And uh, it, it's been an interesting time because we've seen how rapidly governments could react to this uh, and society as a whole can change patterns of behavior and living and thinking about how they're connecting and shaking or not shaking hands and all of that stuff. Um, we've also seen, uh, you know, a lot of uh, dissonance. We've seen some governments uh, get uh, on top of this issue very quickly in a real concerted way and able to uh, 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 try and protect those most marginalized and most affected by uh, both the the disease uh, as well as the, uh, the the economic implications of the shutdowns, and then we've had other uh, governments and jurisdictions where uh, you know it's kind of fallen apart a little bit, and uh, we see some real cracks in the systems. Um, and I, I'm raising that because I think it's uh, it's good context for thinking about what needs to be done around uh, climate specifically. Um, but also the larger environmental crisis, you know, where, uh, say, on the biodiversity front, uh, species extinctions are uh, at a rate uh, never seen before in terms of how many species are being lost, you know, animals, plants, uh, uh, microorganisms. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, this, yeah, we, we really collectively need to have a, a massive think about where have we come from, what is at the root cause of all of these issues and how do we go about trying to uh, shift our society? And COVID in, in a way gives me some hope by seeing that it's amazing how when you get a concerted effort within a country and with the government and industry and, and civil society working together, you can make some big changes. And yet mm. the kind of changes we've seen around COVID are, uh, I, I, I'm going to say it pale in comparison to the sort of larger structural changes 
that need to happen in the coming decades to respond to the environmental crisis. Um, right. So the first thing I'd say is that I think we need to really wrap our heads around what is the nature of this crisis and what does it mean uh, politically. I also think there's a big theme, and I t- sort of touched on it right there because we also see it with COVID, around uh, distributional justice. You know, mm-hmm. who uh, who pays the price of what's wrong right now in terms of other species, but certainly in terms of other people and people around the planet who are uh, disproportionately affected, uh, often by, um, you know, there's a racial dimension, there's a, there's a gender dimension um, to, uh, say, climate change, you know, who's affected. There's a, there's a north-south aspect to that. Um, so the, the, there's a dis- distributional question of who is affected and then who's also going to pay the price. You know, how are we going to uh, ensure that the institutions and say the businesses that are have done well by uh, in, in an era when we've uh, been rather, uh, uh, let's say, fair about how the environment has been treated, how uh, some of the, the, the wealth that was generated from those times can help to uh, steer us down a, a path that's more sustainable and more equitable. Right. Um, so I think those are some big questions. Uh, as we move down that path, I think there's um, there's the, there's the policy questions and understanding the political realm. Um, for example, in the Canadian context, we're in a federal system where each of the provinces have uh, a considerable power over um, environmental and resource related issues, um, and so we need to understand if there's a good idea like say there should be a tax on carbon, you know, how do we do that in, within the political systems that we have? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, By the way, I shouldn't say that I necessarily am the advocate for a carbon tax (laughs) because there's a whole debate about that, which I expect we might get into in these, uh, in these courses. Um, And I guess the final thing that I would say an important theme for me, uh, and it relates to, you know, the land acknowledgement off the beginning is that, you know, I, I think that there's a very real conversation in ecopolitics about uh, the, the the rights and the responsibilities that of other species and of other uh, processes on this planet, and how do we bring sort of an ethical responsibility into political processes so that we're actively thinking about the interests of not just people. Um, and, you know, the, the, the rationales for that, as well as the, the practical ways of doing that, I think are, there's some really interesting questions there. Uh, many Indigenous uh, people in Canada, and I'm thinking of uh, Ojibwe and um, uh, uh, the Iroquois nations as well, talk about all my relations. Um, and they include within that, um, you know, the beavers and the moose and the, uh, the salmon um, uh, as, and, and the trout as, uh, as, and also the, the rocks and the trees as all, as all part of their relations. And that's sort of a, mm-hmm. an ethical positionality, but it's also a way of understanding how all of this stuff fits together. Um, and coming from a, a Western, uh, scientific viewpoint that has been very much shaped by, uh, thinkers like Rene Descartes and um, this sort of the the, uh, the hmm. Enlightenment tradition. The Enlightenment tradition puts a lot of emphasis on the brain and on the separation of the brain right. from the body, uh, and on the separation of the human from the rest of the world. You know, it puts the human in an, in an ethical position of priority, something that we can call anthropocentrism. Um, and it also, uh, it creates a bit of a hierarchy and says that's more important than everything else. And I think this is all, this ontological understanding is then also part of the problem when it comes to the environment. Um, hmm. Because even the word environment, that which surrounds, you know, there is a, there's a trend in ecopolitics to talk about the more than human, to recognize that, that this, the other stuff around us is actually part of us. It feeds us. We feed it when we decompose and die. Um, we're all part of these larger bio and geochemical cycles of nitrogen and carbon and water. Um, and we are, uh, you know, the, the the earth, human beings are the earth in a self-conscious form. Uh, and there are other self-conscious forms, other living beings that have this form. And that kind of a, a, a different ontological perspective is, I think, and the discussions hmm. about that, I think, is quite relevant 
to ecopolitics, which then comes to the last point around epistemology. And epistemology is our understanding of what knowledge is and what mm. constitutes knowledge. Um, and again, within our Western tradition, we have tended to come down to a very interesting but narrow epistemology based on scientific method and and sort of observation and testing and experimentation as a way to generate knowledge that is universally applicable. Um, and it, you know, there's a, there's a, a fantastic and interesting history there of how we know, how we think we know the world around us, but it's also a very reductionist uh, way of thinking that uh, tends to isolate and, take something out of its context and and look at it as a unique thing without understanding that larger relational contextual fabric that enables it to come into being and to which it is related. Um, and so there are other ways of thinking about what, what how the world is and how we should even understand how we know it, hmm. um, which then brings me back to, you know, there's, there's a variety of cultural traditions uh, certainly indigenous people have much more mm -hmm. <clears throat> epistemologies that are much more grounded in a relational sense of being with the more than human. Um, and I think those are all fundamentally eco-political questions that mean that the study of eco-politics is uh, a lot bigger. I would say, you know, some would pe say, some in political science would say, oh, environmental politics is this little sub theme where we just think about how political processes affect the environment. And to them, I would say, actually, it's <laughs> eco-politics and environmental politics is about the bigger picture. And, and you know, the human mm. institutional questions are this small set, subset of these much mm. bigger relational questions that I think we need to get into in this field. So that's some of what I think is uh, exciting, actually, about ecopolitics. We're in an era of, of crisis, and yet it's, it's causing this rethink across all these different levels. We need to start doing things very differently. Um, and, uh, it's, and in that sense, I see it as an area of huge opportunity. And I'm actually looking forward to some of the people that we're going to talk to um, I won't name them now, but people can see the the list on the website and and get a sense of what's coming. Uh, there's a lot of people doing some really exciting and innovative stuff to think through and address some of what uh, I've just been talking about. Absolutely. For your part, Ryan, I'm really curious to hear what what you are excited about when and what are the some of the big themes of ecopolitics that you think uh, this series should get into. Sure. Well, I mean, you you mentioned a whole bunch of themes that that I would uh, echo, and maybe just briefly um, to 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 get into some of these things. You know, you you talked about epistemology and uh, ways of knowing, and that's also an entry point for me into eco politics. Um, I the way I usually teach a course in eco politics, and most of our listeners, I, I think, will be students. Um, is I really want to challenge my students to think to 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 challenge the idea of universal epistemologies to challenge the idea that there is a singular version of sustainability and one of the ways I do that is get my students to uh, debate and I think you do this as well debate you know uh, common environmental policy questions and one of the things that comes out of that is just seeing how things that might seem like, you know, there's a common sense pathway to sustainability are much more complex. There's usually more to it than just, you know, one way of thinking about mm -hmm. things. Um, and so, and so that's important to me to, mm -hmm. to, to think about. And that um, leads into, as you said, you know, the, the importance of thinking about um, other types of worldviews and ontologies. And, and we will be getting into as you said, uh, talking about indig indigenous environmental politics and and um, traditional ecological knowledge, um, which is one part of that big theme, um, and that's an important uh, thing I think because this podcast and uh, you know the theme of, e of of this eco politics podcast does have a bit of a Canadian bent to it, a, a Canadian focus. I think it's absolutely essential, as you mentioned, to spend time uh and not just a cursory you know week on this but likes to, to actually spend some time uh 
really thinking about the historical context of the Canadian state, um, not just in terms of its relationship with Indigenous people, but uh, with all types of people who have who have, and immigrants and settlers from coming from different parts of the world, and also contemporary relations between the Canadian state and other states and other peoples around the world. Um, ultimately, because you know. One part of politics is thinking about, as you mentioned, who benefits, who loses, and and the sort of distribution of of power and access um, and, and wealth in our society. And and you know the Canadian state was founded upon an unequal relationship and a, and and, and, and uh, you know <laughs> an oppressive um, system of colonialism, which which has impacted that distrib- that question of distributional justice um, until present day. Uh, and that's really important for the ecological context, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so, so I'm excited to talk about those, uh, those themes. And then that kind of leads for me into a- another theme, which is the Canadian state's res- relationship historically and, you know, contemporarily with resource st- extraction. Um, this was a state, and mm-hmm. this is closely tied into that question of, of, of how the Canadian uh, settler state was set up. But this was a state that was founded upon the extraction of resources in an imperial relationship with Great Britain and to an extent France. And then uh, that locus of power later shifted <laughs> in the in the post-war years towards the United States uh, when the United States uh, took on a sort of a hegemonic role internationally. And Canada has always been... Uh, you know, has always had an uncomfortable place in that world in, in uh, f- fomenting global imperialism or, or at least, um, you know, keeping, you know, keeping global imperialism afloat. And that in turn is, has been founded on the extraction of resources, you know, everything from uh, beaver pelts to cod to uh, wheat to so on and so forth to today bitumen right uh, coming out of Alberta. But anyway, I think that's really important for students yeah. of ecopolitics to think about, and that leads into my final thematic, you know, uh, focus, which I really want to make sure we we get across in ecopolitics, which is about contemporary capitalism, and we often hear in ecopolitics about you know. Either there's sort of this this cursory like blaming capitalism for everything, which I think we want to we want to dig a little bit deeper into these kinds of claims about capitalism. And and on the flip side, sometimes you hear this sort of this overall arcing acceptance of capitalism that it's we need to make this about you know how to make capitalism more sustainable. And I think what we're aiming for is to have more nuanced discussions about. What exactly is it about contemporary capitalism that, you know, shapes the environment in one way or another? And what are the prospects for actually making capitalism more sustainable? Or is that, you know, a lost cause? Do we need to start thinking about other ways of organizing our political economic structure for the sake of of dealing with this ecological crisis, which you you talked about? Um and those are, I know those are discussions that students are having and, and many of our listeners will be uh, thinking about, but I'm really excited to spend some time uh, digging into that a little bit more. Yeah, we have big hopes for this podcast and series, and uh, we've uh, created a list of amazing people that we're talking to across the country and uh, uh, and at least in one or two cases uh, internationally on some of these issues. Um, I guess because we've named colonialism and we've named capitalism, uh, I also think it's uh, important to name patriarchy mm-hmm. um, and that there's a gender dimension dimension to environmental politics. Um, uh, and, and, you know, earlier on, I talked about the sort of the uh, Descartes and the sort of the rationalist uh, way of thinking that places mind above body. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of great feminist analysis of how this also privileged uh, in the history of patriarchy, the, the male over the female, with the female then associated with the body, as have Indigenous people been associated with the body. There's also been mm-hmm. a, a race dimension. Um, and then basically with a, uh, you know, that we have a, a Western way of thinking that, that creates that dualism and then says one is better than the other. 
than the right. other. Um, and um, so, and there's a lot of uh, thinkers in environmental politics. And I'm thinking of uh, the eco-feminist activist Vandana Shiva, for example, from India, who really sees that it's not anthropocentrism that is the problem, but it's androcentrism, this hmm. male-centered way of thinking about the world and what matters. Um, and she argues, you know, in part because women have been associated with the body in sort of a, a social construction through history, uh, that uh, women's knowledge is often also then perhaps a privilege, a knowledge that should uh, be given more um uh, acceptance and recognition for, in the same way that we talk about indigenous traditional ecological knowledge, for example, as uh, ways of knowing that um, can can help to counter some of the uh, the various negative, the very negative trends of this androcentric way of thinking. So, just to put one more big ism in there, I <laughs> really hope that we're also going to be talking about racism in the context of uh, eco politics, because again, there's a there's a big story there about what environmental racism looks like and what environmental justice might mean in, in that context. Hmm. Uh, but that's all to come. So uh, I, uh, you know, there's some, there's some big issues that we want to get into and I'm really looking forward to going there with you, Ryan, in the, in the coming weeks. Thank you for your thoughts, sharing your thoughts. I hope the listeners have uh, enjoyed this introductory episode of the EcoPolitics Podcast. Of course, uh, don't forget to check out some of the other episodes. Uh, we do have a whole series coming up, and that is available at ecopoliticspodcast.ca. Um, don't forget to like us on social media and share your thoughts with us. Get in touch. Uh, sh- we'd love to hear feedback on the show. So thanks once again. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you to the listener. And we look forward to chatting with you in uh, future episodes. Bye.